thank you for joining us for Pact. I'm the P, Peter Coffin. With me is the lovely Ms. Astronaut Cowboy Doctor, the ACD. Uh, together we're packed. <laughs> Hi. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast service. Also, leave us a glowing review on Audible and Apple Podcasts. Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash packedpod, P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Your monthly support gets you into our Discord server. Uh, it gets you exclusive content, and you see some content before everyone else. We have also got fantastic packed merch available. Finally, the most important thing you can do for us is to tell your friends. We rely <laughs> so big on word of mouth. So, so big. We stream 7 p.m. Saturday evenings. Thank you very much for tuning in. So last week, we started our talk on socialism, utopian, and scientific. Basically, what we went through was what a utopian socialist is. The historical Wh development of utopian socialism. We talked about three examples, San Simone, uh, Fourier, and Owen, and these very well-intentioned people of their time kind of abstracting and thinking about and even applying in their own societal positions what a more equitable, just society would look like. As this was, as Engel said, the time where society or the world stood upon its head. Everything was being critiqued. Everything was nuanced. We were in the Enlightenment. We want to we want to find out the ultimate truth, the ultimate goal by which all of us should live. Everything of the past is being rejected and criticized. We're looking for that platonic ideal yeah. of the end of history. Absolute truth understander, the justest, equitablest society. Um, and these three people were very well-intentioned and for the conditions of their time were proposing ideas that were noble and admirable. And even Owen accomplished a lot well yeah that's what like i said in their societal positions even implementing some of these yeah. abstract ideas but in talking about the historical development this utopian socialism does not work because it is not embedded within the historical conditions of where it is being applied the further and further and further you abstract um, and, and think about what this society should look like the further from reality you get in the ability to implement it effectively. And that's kind of, well, kind of compliment sandwiching these three individuals. Yeah. How uh, utopian socialism doesn't work. The last line of the previous section is about uh, finding a material grounding for what socialism is. Now, part of the reason why this whole platonic ideal of end of history socialism thing doesn't work is because it assumes like immutable, unchanging circumstances in both the idea of socialism and that the conditions of the world today can accept that sort of idea and simply move towards it. Now, the reason Ingalls gets into dialectics is because this is not how the world works. <laughs> right. Dialectics is about how the thesis and the antithesis both can exist at the same time. The yes and the no are both there and, and, and are actually related to each other. And, and, and also about how viewing various subjects, items, um, issues, etc. as discrete categorically separate objects can restrict our view on things. It's not just that it can, it does. Nothing exactly. is static and just existing in a vacuum by itself. Exactly. And dialectics is simply the idea that that's not the case. There was somebody who responded to something I said where I just said the word dialectics at some point and, and the response was, oh, well, don't you think people can't really understand that? The word dialectics isn't really relatable or anything like that. And it's like, well, it's the concept that societies are in flux and in motion. Yeah. In the context of their historical conditions. Whether intentional or not, people who have these, like, sanctimonious stances on theory about how it's, it's not important and it's dissociated from, like, what workers really experience... Mm -hmm. Whether intentional or not, what that is doing is uneducating the worker yeah. of their circumstances. And so uh, this is important. It's important to understand dialectics. And then the other thing is learning a new concept isn't necessarily yeah. relatable. Like the yeah. concept of communism 
is not something that is relatable. Like, yeah, also, none of us yeah. have ever lived in communism. And it really also undermines the idea that society is something that has to progress forward and, and, and move into new modes of being. Also, it is never regular people who are saying reading theory is um, actually classist. It's the academics. It's people who have time to talk about that on Twitter, but not read it like that one person. Yeah. yeah. Um, people who see themselves above the working class, too, as an arbiter of the interests of the working class, because they are the ones who get to tell you what's important and what's not. Right. Every time I see someone say something like that, I think of Angela Davis talking about her experiences with the Black Panthers, about people who couldn't read taking time to learn to read in their communities to read Lenin and understanding it better than any, as she describes it, like academic scholar or sociologist would. Um, so don't listen to any of that shit. Talking about dialectics, it is not classist. Um, it is absolutely essential yeah. uh, for you to understand the dynamics of what things are working. Not only is it important just for at a given time for these socialist projects or ideas to be connected and embedded within the historical conditions of their time, but also that those historical conditions move with every infinite fraction of a second and they change. And as they're changing, they're interacting with every single other phenomena while happening and just constantly changing and constantly in flux and utopian socialists or, or anybody who is trying to manifest the idea or the abstract thought or platonic goal of something into existence even the most just society um, is not going to be able to account for that no. The other thing I want to mention is somebody said, wouldn't like Robert Owen have had to rely on slavery in the U.S. like to even implement his utopian socialist project among his workers? Uh, yes, that brings us to the idea of utopian socialism not being dialectic and that it doesn't consider the things that are happening around them. It considers it happening in isolation of Owen's workplace. Um but utopian socialist projects inherently being unable to account for the international proletariat. Well, the other thing, um, if you recall, that Ingalls talks about is how he thought that you could just apply the concepts at his factory to any other factory right. in the whole of Europe. Exactly. And, and but then that, what the fuck are you doing in Africa or America for people who are enslaved or indentured? Yeah. And, and it's not even necessarily true that you could apply it at every other factory in Europe. Right. Well, you couldn't. That That's not true. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, understanding that's what we're getting into tonight, we're going to start reading part two of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. The section is entitled Dialectics. In the meantime, along with and after the French philosophy of the 18th century, had arisen the new German philosophy culminating in Hegel. Its greatest merit was the taking up again of dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. The old Greek philosophers were all born natural dialecticians, and Aristotle, the most encyclopedic of them, had already analyzed the most essential forms of dialectic thought. The newer philosophy, on the other hand, although in it also dialectics had brilliant exponents, like Descartes and Spinoza. Can you please reread that and say Descartes? Descartes. Yeah. See, Peter can't even read. Yeah, I, I'm. I am the. I am the rube that you're <laughs> claiming this isn't for. Yeah. Um, but like actually, no, like for genuinely, real. <laughs> like I have a high school education. I do not have a college uh, education. Um, the newer philosophy, on the other hand, although in it also dialectics had brilliant exponents, e.g. Descartes and Spinoza, had, especially through English influence, become more and more rigidly fixed in the so-called metaphysical mode of reasoning, by which also the French of the 18th century were almost wholly dominated at all events in their special philosophical work. Outside philosophy in the restricted sense, the French nevertheless produced masterpieces of dialectic. We need only to call to mind these works. <laughs> we give here, in brief, the essential character of these two modes of thought. In order to understand these details, we must detach them from their natural, special causes, effects, etc. 
This is primarily the task of natural science and historical research. Branches of science which the Greek of classical times, on very good grounds, relegated to a subordinate position because they had, first of all, to collect materials for these sciences to work upon. A certain amount of natural and historical material must be collected before there can be any critical analysis, comparison, and arrangement in classes, orders, and species. The foundations of the exact natural sciences were, therefore, first worked out by the Greeks of the Alexandrian period, and later on in the Middle Ages by the Arabs. Real natural science dates from the second half of the 15th century, and thence onward it had advanced with constantly increasing rapidity. The analysis of nature into its individual parts, the grouping of the different natural processes and objects in definite classes, the study of the internal anatomy of organized bodies in their manifold forms, these were the fundamental conditions of the gigantic strides in our knowledge of nature that have been made during the last 400 years. But this method of work has also left us as legacy the habit of observing natural objects and processes in isolation, apart from their connection with the vast whole, of observing them in repose, not in motion, as constraints, not as essentially variables, in their death, not in their life. And when this way of looking at things was transferred by Bacon and Locke from natural science to philosophy, it begot the narrow metaphysical mode of thought peculiar to the last century. Right. So he's talking about how, you know, as the 15th century rolls around and, and we start studying things philosophically in the way that we think of science today, natural sciences, a philosophical development that's kind of around the Renaissance period and... Um, the precursors to enlightenment and all of this, it afforded us a lot of great scientific findings, but it necessitated that we look at these different factors through this line of thinking in contrast to the primitive conceptualization of dialectics by the Greeks. Um, we're isolating these factors because that's kind of what empirical science encourages you to do or incentivizes to do so that you can understand how something works, you want to limit as much variation as possible so that you can understand. It's it's like when you think of a randomized control trial. You want as few changing variables as possible because you want to manipulate and isolate a variable to find something or to, to understand exactly what one facet of something is doing because all of these other things are confunding the ability to observe mm -hmm. um, what that thing actually does by itself. But that's, that's not how stuff works. That's not how stuff works. And, and that's why if you talk about like the conundrum between like internal validity of a randomized controlled trial and its ecological validity and how it generalizes to the world, you have concerns and you always have to account for that when, when you're talking about modern research um, because the way to optimize the internal validity of your findings is to minimize as much change as possible outside of what you're studying. And this is encouraged by this metaphysical line of thinking when it's brought into, not from natural sciences, but then to philosophical movements from Bacon and Locke is encouraging us to look at even philosophical phenomena through static categorical, unmoving, non-interacting entities, which is not how abstract concepts work either. Uh, and from there, you, you have the idea of, for instance, social versus economic issues. Yeah, I mean, that's a yeah, very yeah. long... That's a good example of how that's applied a, now. Yeah, there's a big trek between then and now, but that is how that type of situation is applied now. Like, you act as though a social issue is somehow magically disconnected from the economic base, the thing that dictates how power is distributed in the world. Somehow social issues have nothing to do with that. They're just something that you can address by, you know, telling people to behave differently or establishing different norms or representing an image a certain way. And that's not how things work. It's right. never going to be how things work. And this is why we have to regard everything as a connected system. Because that is the dialectical way of regarding it. And that's also the shortcomings of Bacon and Locke in that it is conducive to this further, increasingly further abstraction into non-reality, into just thinking in our minds, into these platonic goals or concepts to which we're working towards that we can just manifest into society without regard for 
what's historically happening and how those historical events are moving and interacting with one another, which brings us back to what we said. Yeah, exactly. About not being able to manifest socialism and however we think it's supposed to look like. Also, yes, the whole idea of we can do both is absolutely like, rooted in the metaphysical separation of these things because it regards them as separate as, things. Yeah, so exactly. it inherently approaches them incorrectly. That is such a very specific like screw up of undialectical thinking. It's not, but we can do both. It's there is no both. Like it's one thing. Uh, social issues are economic issues. Economic issues are social issues. It is there is no way to separate them because they are one thing. Be careful. Um you might be committing violence against that small bean streamer. Uh oh. That, I mean, that's we brought actually... attention to that for someone who was separating those issues and saying how some anti class reductionist argument. And we very kindly brought attention to that on one of our streams. And this person said that we were directing transphobic hate towards her because we disagreed with her not just disagree with her pointed out how she was incorrect and doesn't understand dialectics but again here's the really specific aspect of that that is another issue where we said it all comes back yeah, to socialism <laughs> utopian and scientific because that's like a perfect application of people not understanding the importance of viewing these things through an actual scientific lens as opposed to the utopian one that all of these quote unquote socialists and really let's just be frank the liberals and all of these people who are professing some change which is antithetical to the ruling class that we just need to get everybody on board so that they can vote or express their opinion and the system will acquiesce their demands that's not how things work and this is why. To the metaphysician, things in their mental reflexes, ideas, are isolated, are to be considered one after the other and apart from each other, are objects of investigation fixed, rigid, given once for all. He thinks in absolutely irreconcilable antitheses. His communication is yay, yay, nay, nay. <laughs> <laughs> for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. For him, a thing either exists or does not exist. A thing cannot at the same time be itself and something else. Positive and negative absolutely exclude one another. Cause and effect stand in a rigid antithesis, one to the other. At first sight, this mode of thinking seems to us very luminous because it is that of so-called sound common sense. Only sound common sense, respectable fellow that he is, in the homely realm of his own four walls, has a very has very wonderful adventures directly he ventures out into the wide world of research and the metaphysical mode of thought justifiable and necessary as it is in a number of domains whose extent varies according to the nature of the particular object of investigation sooner or later reaches a limit beyond which it becomes one-sided restricted abstract lost in insoluble contradictions in the complementation of individual things it forgets the connection between them and the contemplation of their existence. It forgets the beginning and the end of that existence of their repose. It forgets their emotion. It cannot see the woods for the trees. And this is exactly the flaw, like maybe not. Yes. In natural science, but especially in the social sciences is looking at these things in isolation or even like clinical or medical sciences where like, how are these interventions going to work when applied to the population who is experiencing things that aren't controlled in a laboratory setting? Um, that's the problem of external or ecological validity. And so we, we could all benefit from dialectics in all fields. For everyday purposes, we know and can say, for example, whether an animal is alive or not. But upon closer inquiry, we find that this is, in many cases, a very complex question, as the jurists know very well. They have cudgeled their brains in vain to discover a rational limit beyond which the killing of the child in its mother's womb is murder. I mean, that even, that applies today. That's the, the abortion argument, is it not? Yeah. yeah. It is just as impossible to determine absolutely the moment of death, for physiology proves that death is not an instantaneous momentary phenomenon, but a very protracted process. In like manner, every organized being is every moment the same and not the same. Every moment it assimilates matter supplied from without and gets rid of other matter. Every moment some cells of its body die and others build themselves anew. 
in a longer or shorter time, the matter of its body is completely renewed and is replaced by other molecules of matter, so that every organized being is always itself and yet something other than itself. That's fucking beautiful. That's so good. It's so good. Just the idea that something is constantly cycling through like a life process and therefore always changing is not just something that you can apply to yourself as a human being. We, we very much is that, but it's also something you can apply to a society, which is constantly uh, like a, a, one business may go out, something may become unavailable. Some link in the supply chain may change. Some person with a lot of power, somebody in the ruling class might change their mind on something. Uh, they might decide that they want to own an entire town and, and implement alchemy to turn money into love, that type of thing. <laughs> um, things change. The conditions of the society change at all times. And that's why you can't just say like, well, this is the exact end result we want, because in order to get to that result, you need conditions that are conducive to that result. And conditions are never the same, ever. From day to day, conditions change, even though they might seem the same to like second a worker. To second. Who has a, it's changing right now. The, flaccid it, erect, flaccid erect. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. I just said it. Some of our cells are dying and some of them are, are mitotically dividing to replace the dead ones. Mm -hmm. And I am the same ostensibly to you. And in, in reality, I am the same, but I am also different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're sitting here, we're having a conversation. You're not thinking of us as uh, having molecular cellular processes going on, which are, again, killing cells and rebuilding them. But that's happening. It's happening to you, too. Right. And as I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, as I'm interpreting the information, my cognitive experiences are changing. The probability that I'm going to do the next thing next is changing. I could say something very insulting and just get you to stop entirely. Yeah. I'm not going to because I love this person, but. Thank you, P. Further, we find upon closer investigation that the two poles of an antithesis positive and negative, for example, are as inseparable as they are opposed, and that despite all their opposition, they mutually interpenetrate. Hello. Mm. And we find, in like manner, that cause and effect are conceptions which only hold good in their application to individual cases, but as soon as we consider the individual cases in their general connection with the universe as a whole, they run into each other, and they become confounded when we contemplate that universal action and reaction in which causes and effects are eternally changing places, so that what is effect here and now will be caused there and then, and vice versa. These things that seem and are in line of formal thought or metaphysical thinking or our respectable fellow common sense are on opposite sides or opposite extremes of things, they are just as inextricable from one another as they are different. It's not just identifying contradictions. It's acknowledging the fact that things that apparently, according to our formal thought of common sense, can't exist at the same time, do mm -hmm. and will. Um, and it, it that also ties into the idea of nothing being static or one thing at a point in time. It's a multiplicity of things. It's constantly in motion and interacting with every other object, which is also a multiplicity of things interacting with all of the objects around it. Um, one like pretty, it's something that I think of automatically because I'm a therapist, dialectical behavior therapy. Mm. One of the central points of dialectical behavioral therapy which is a, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy technically but dialectical behavioral therapy specifically focuses particularly among individuals with difficult personality patterns with a lot of suicidality with a lot of self-harm is focused on emotional regulation based off of the idea that two or not even just two but for example two seemingly contradictory ideas in our mind can be held at the same time and that that dissonance is not something that is impossible or bad or something that needs to be avoided but is a natural process of human thought human feeling human behavior and that's okay 
And a lot of the emotional regulation that comes with DBT is in the dialectic of this can be true, this can be true, and they can be an antagonism against one another. And that's okay. We can still live and function and have relationships with people and be ourselves. So that is the name dialectical behavioral therapy is coming from the word dialectic because it it has so much to do with prioritizing the importance of holding that dissonance in a way that is comfortable and accepting. Um, you can have loving feelings for someone and you can have vengeful feelings for someone at the same time. That's at the individual level. Say you have a thing that is scheduled, like a get together or, or something like that. You can both want to go and not want to go. <laughs> yeah. A good societal example, which admittedly is talking about individuals as a collective group. But again, let's remember the the gestalt of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The working class of America subscribes to an ideology that works against its interests. Mm. And that's because of their embedment within a society that's dictated to them by the ruling class. To simply accept ideology would then be a dialectic because ideology is something dictated by the ruling class and usually in the interests of the ruling class as opposed to the working class. So to be a working class person and accept an ideology that is put forward by the ruling class is hence you existing in a dialectic. Our lives are dictated by ideology of the ruling class even though we are actively antagonistic towards it, our thoughts, feelings, and behavior are still affected by um, and influenced by neoliberal ideology. Another example of the dialectic at, at a larger societal level, corporations can ostensibly advocate and even spread good messages about marginalized populations, given it racial and or ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, even low income people, rural people, they can put forth a message that is supportive of the interests of those people, while materially not because they're corporations and they exist solely to make profit um, and thus hinder the interests of the most underserved in our society. None of these processes and modes of thought enters into the framework of metaphysical reasoning. Dialectics, on the other hand, comprehends things and their representations, ideas, in their essential concatenation, motion, origin, and ending. Such processes, as those mentioned above, are, therefore, so many corroborations of its own method of procedure. Nature is the proof of dialectics, and it must be said for modern science that it has furnished this proof with very rich materials increasingly daily and thus has shown that, in the last resort, nature works dialectically and not metaphysically, that she does not move in the eternal oneness of a perpetually recurring cycle, but goes through a real historical evolution. In this connection, Darwin must be named before all others. He dealt the metaphysical conception of nature the heaviest blow by his proof that all organic beings, plants, animals, and man himself are the products of a process of evolution going on through millions of years. But, the naturalists, who have learned to think dialectically, are few and far between, and this conflict of the results of discovery with preconceived modes of thinking explains the endless confusion now reigning in theoretical nature science, the despair of teachers as well as learners, of authors and readers alike. Essentially, it's hard to grasp a completely different mode of thinking, is what he's trying to say there, I think. Yeah. Like, the teacher might come in dialectically and attempt to explain things in this way, while the student might take away from it something entirely different. An exact representation of the universe, of its evolution, of the development of mankind, and of the reflection of this evolution in the minds of men can therefore only be obtained by the methods of dialectics with its constant regard to the innumerable actions and reactions of life and death, of progressive or retrogressive changes. And in this spirit, the new German philosophy has worked. Kant began his career by resolving the stable solar system of Newton and its eternal duration after the famous initial impulse had been once given, into the result of a historical process, the formation of the sun and all the planets out of a rotating nebulous mass. From this, he at the same time drew the conclusion that, given this origin of the solar system, its future death followed of necessity. 
His theory, half a century later, was established mathematically by Laplace, and half a century after that, the spectroscope proved the existence in space of such incandescent masses of gas in various stages of condensation. This new German philosophy culminated in the Hegelian system. In this system, and herein is its great merit, for the first time the whole world, natural, historical, intellectual, is represented as a process, i.e. as in constant motion, change, transformation, development, and the attempt is made to trace out the internal connection that makes a continuous whole of all of this movement and development. From this point of view, the history of mankind no longer appeared as a wild world of senseless deeds of violence, all equally condemnable, at the judgment seat of mature philosophic reason, and which are best forgotten as quickly as possible, but as the process of evolution of man himself. It was now the task of the intellect to follow the gradual march of this process through all its devious ways, and to trace out the inner law running through all its apparently accidental phenomena. Now this is regarding humanity's development, not as a series of, like he said, violent events in which we must look back upon and say, oh, it was all irrational, and therefore it was all evil and bad. Right. We have to look at it as the process of humanity coming into itself. The evolution of humanity, these conflicts, these resolutions, the things that happen, the interactions, the decisions, the varying conditions that develop and create the world as we know it today. We would not have what we have right now if all of that had not happened. We don't just look back upon it and say, oh, get rid of it. We have to have that account and we have to see it as part of our own development. That the Hegelian system did not solve the problem it propounded is here immaterial. Its epoch-making merit was that it propounded the problem. This problem is one that no single individual will ever be able to solve. Although Hegel was, with St. Simon, the most encyclopedic mind of his time, yet he was limited, first, by the necessary limited extent of his own knowledge, and second, by the limited extent and depth of the knowledge and conceptions of his age. To these limits, a third must be added. Hegel was an idealist. To him, the thoughts within his brain were not the more or less abstract pictures of actual things and processes, but, conversely, things in their evolution were only the realized pictures of the idea, existing somewhere from eternity before the world was. Some ultimate, abstracted, theoretical idea um, to which we can manifest what is <laughs> theoretically right and just and yeah. good. Um, and I don't even mean manifest as a joke. I, I mean, like, actually, like, we can implement this based off of everybody thinking that this is the good by which we should be striving or to which we should be striving. Um, that's idealism. That's utopianism. It's Medicare for all. I mean, Medicare for all would be good, but it is a policy change that you would want to implement through the current system, which is ultimately in total conflict of interest to the ruling class, and therefore it will not allow something like that to happen. That's why we don't have Medicare for all. Our political conditions are not appropriate for it at the time. Yes, exactly. That's why we don't have Medicare for all. That's why Bernie Sanders, they rearranged the entire primary not to have him as the Democratic nominee. That stuff happened because uh, you cannot just say, hey, this would be good. Let's vote for it. This way of thinking turned everything upside down and completely reversed the actual connection of things in the world. Correctly and ingeniously, as many groups of facts were grasped by Hegel, yet, for the reasons just given, there is much that is botched, artificial, labored, in a word, wrong, in point of detail. The Hegelian system itself was a colossal miscarriage, but it was also the last of its kind. It was suffering, in fact, from an internal and incurable contradiction, Upon the one hand, its essential proposition was the conception that human history is a process of evolution, which, by its very nature, cannot find its intellectual final term in the discovery of any so-called absolute truth. But on the other hand, it laid claim to being the very essence of this absolute truth, a system of natural and historical knowledge, embracing everything and final for all time, is a contradiction to the fundamental law of dialectic reasoning. This is also future-proofing dialectical materialism right here. It's saying that this is built to be built upon. Right. There are people who say, well, 
Returning to Marx and all of those things, that is a bad idea because these guys existed in a different time and all of this blah, blah, blah. No, they built a damn good foundation and you are intended to add to it. Right, exactly. Just like um, people say, oh, imperialism existed before capitalism. Okay, but imperialism now exists in the context of late stage capitalism. So that's what fucking matters, not the fact that empires existed. Before. Yeah, exactly. This law indeed by no means excludes, but on the contrary, includes the idea that the systematic knowledge of the external universe can make giant strides from age to age. That's what we just said. Exactly. The Galilean system just... set this foundation, was limited by the limitations of the thinker, Hegel himself, the limitations of the material conditions of the time, and also just Hegel being an idealist. But these things are built upon. So the perception of the fundamental contradiction in German idealism led necessarily back to materialism, but note bene, not, not to the simply metaphysical, exclusively mechanical materialism of the 18th century. Old materialism looked upon all previous history as a crude heap of irrationality and violence. Modern materialism sees in it the process of evolution of humanity and aims at discovering the laws thereof. With the French of the 18th century, and even with Hegel, the conception obtained of nature as a whole, moving in narrow circles and forever immutable, still unchanging, with its eternal celestial bodies as Newton and unalterable organic species as Linnaeus taught. Modern materialism embraces the more recent discoveries of natural science, according to which nature also has its history and time. The celestial bodies, like the organic species that, under favorable conditions, people them, being born and perishing. And even if nature, as a whole, must still be said to move in recurrent cycles, these cycles assume infinitely larger dimensions. In both aspects, modern materialism is essentially dialectic and no longer requires the assistance of that sort of philosophy which, queen-like, pretended to rule the remaining <laughs> mob of sciences. As soon as each special science is bound to make clear its position in the great totality of things and of our knowledge of things, a special science dealing with this totality is superfluous or unnecessary. That which still survives of all earlier philosophy is the science of thought and its law, formal logic and dialectics. Everything else is subsumed in the positive science of nature and history. Whilst, however, the revolution in the conception of nature could only be made in proportion to the corresponding positive materials furnished by research, already much earlier, certain historical facts had occurred which led to a decisive change in the conception of history. In 1831, the first working class rising took place in Lyons. Between 1838 and 1842, the first national working class movement, that of the English Chartist, reached its height. The class struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie came to the front in the history of the most advanced countries in Europe in proportion to the development, upon the one hand, of modern industry, upon the other, of the newly acquired political supremacy of the bourgeoisie. Facts more and more strenuously gave the lie to the teachings of bourgeois economy as to the identity of the interests of capital and labor, as to the universal harmony and the universal prosperity that would be the consequence of unbridled competition. All these things could no longer be ignored any more than the French and English socialism, which was their theoretical, though very imperfect, expression. But the old idealist conception of history, which was not yet dislodged, knew nothing of class struggles based upon economic interest, knew nothing of economic interest, production in all economic relations, appeared only in it as incidental, subordinate elements in the history of civilization. Again, showing this historical evolution of where even the utopian socialists were in comparison to the time exactly. before um, when the bourgeoisie were the revolutionary characters. Um, and, and showing how that evolves sets the stage for how scientific socialism can be brought about following this foundation. Mm -hmm. And therein not as an end of history thing, because scientific socialism necessarily resists an end of history conceptualization exactly. of society. Which is why communism is not a utopian mode of thinking. Right. To assume that we can abolish class and the state is not to assume that we can establish a perfect society that never changes ever again. The new facts made imperative a new examination of all past history. 
Then it was seen that all past history, with the exception of its primitive stages, was the history of class struggles. That these warring classes of society are always the products of the modes of production and exchange, in a word, of the economic conditions of their time. That the economic structure of society always furnishes the real basis, starting from which we alone can work out the ultimate explanation of the whole superstructure of juridical and political institutions, as well as of the religious, philosophical, and other ideas of a given historical period. Hegel has freed history from metaphysics. He made it dialectic, but his conception of history was essentially idealistic. But now, idealism was driven from its last refuge, the philosophy of history. Now a materialistic treatment of history was propounded, and a method found of explaining man's quote-unquote knowing by his quote-unquote being, instead of, heretofore, his being by his knowing. What we know comes from what we are what we do, what exists, as opposed to what exists comes from what we know. And it's just like that that even gets to the the relationship between the economic base and superstructure. Absolutely. Which superstructure is contained in all of the the culture, interpersonal relations, the way that we think, feel and behave as individuals operating in society. These are that superstructure. That's all things that are dictated by the economic base and those cultural influences, one of them being, you know, ideology maintains the economic base of capitalism. This is a foundational condition of scientific socialism. I mean, you even hear in that statement itself, yeah. the idea that you cannot simply will fundamental change into being. It is not about knowing dictating the being. Instead, It is being dictating the knowing. From that time forward, socialism was no longer an accidental discovery of this or that ingenious brain, but the necessary outcome of the struggle between two historically developed classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Its task was no longer to manufacture a system of society as perfect as possible, but to examine the historico-economic succession of events from which these classes and their antagonism had of necessity sprung, and to discover in the economic conditions thus created the means of ending the conflict. But the socialism of earlier days was as incompatible with this materialist conception as the conception of nature of the French materialists was with dialectics and modern natural science. The socialism of earlier days certainly criticized the existing capitalistic mode of production and its consequences, but it could not explain them, and therefore it could not get the mastery of them. It could only simply reject them as bad. Fuck, that's good. Yeah. God damn. I get so revved up when I get through this fucking, like... It's good. It's good shit. I absolutely love this fucking text. Yeah. It it's still so fucking relevant today. It that, is. That is what the left and communist identifying people are doing all the time is saying that capitalism is bad. And I guess that's it. It's yeah. either capitalism is bad and there's nothing we can do about it or capitalism is bad. Um, so vote it in, please. And we see how well that's worked. Marxism is dialectical materialism. Marxism is a dialectical project. There is no Marxism you, without dialectics. You can't be a utopian socialist if you're considering historical phenomena and entities as interacting and in constant motion with one another. Because if you considered historical conditions dialectically, you wouldn't be trying to posit an abstracted version of what socialism would be and will it to existence because you would understand that that's not how it works. And this is why all of these people on Twitter who claim to be Marxists, this is why Vosh claiming that Marxism is, is like libertarian, libertarian socialism. socialism. Oh He's just God. a straight Marxist. This is why they're all full of shit. They don't look at the history of it. They don't regard it as an evolutionary process. They don't regard these things as ever-changing. They don't look at uh, even an individual as an ever-changing entity. You're basically always the same thing in people's eyes. You never change. You're either a horrible person who makes bad decisions and ultimately comes to bad ideology, or you're a great person who is going to help us establish socialism somehow by voting Biden in. 
Yeah. Um, the more strongly this earlier socialism denounced the exploitation of the working class, inevitable under capitalism, the less able was it clearly to show in what this exploitation consisted and how it arose. But for this, it was necessary to present the capitalistic mode of production in its historical connection and its inevitableness during a particular historical period, and therefore also to present its inevitable downfall and to lay bare its essential character, which was still a secret. This was done by the discovery of surplus value. So the way that they conceptualized history previous to dialectical materialism was this idea that it was a bunch of irrational and evil actions that were to be denounced and simply left into the dustbin of history, Moralizing. so to speak. That is how the utopian socialist criticized capitalism. Capitalism is simply bad. It's simply evil. It's simply irrational. Whatever It's thing through a you... moralistic lens that yes. contradicts the platonic, good, just, equitable brotherly objectives <laughs> of the time. And, um, it, and this is another statement that I think really illustrates that very well. Um, and then it transitions into talk of the discoveries that Marx gave us, which move us into the era of scientific socialism, the first right. of which was surplus value. The specific mechanics of how workers are, are not compensated for their labor in accordance with what their labor produces. It was shown that the appropriation of unpaid labor is the basis of the capitalist mode of production and of the exploitation of the worker that occurs under it. That even if the capitalist buys the labor power of his laborer at its full value as a commodity on the market, he yet extracts more value from it than he paid for. And that in the ultimate analysis, this surplus value forms those sums of value from which are heaped up constantly increasing the masses of capital in the hands of the possessing classes. The genesis of capitalist production and the production of capital were both explained. That's so cute that like that was the discovery. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, your employer doesn't pay you for what you do. That's all that means is is you are not compensated for your labor in accordance to what it produces. Your your capitalist, your employer, the owner of the means of production with which you are working extracts value from your labor that you are not getting as the person who exercised that labor and created what is being sold for profit. Marx came up with formulas to show that. Yeah. And then everybody was like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Holy fuck. They could just take it. They're just taking shit from everybody. Yeah. Actually, no, they kind of knew that already. They didn't need mathematical formulas. Well, we were... yeah. And again, this is a this is Marx, right? Bourgeois economists act like this is like impossible to understand and whatever. But like I workers think, inherently understand. Yeah. These two great discoveries, the materialistic conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalistic production through surplus value, we owe to Marx. With these discoveries, socialism became a science. The next thing was to work out all its details and relations. This section of the book is setting up how Marx came to the conclusions he came to which we have to understand as part of the evolution of our knowledge and conceptualization of what capitalism is. Without that, we can't actually understand what the material conditions are now and thus can't even pretend to put forward any kind of solution. And if we do, we're just pulling shit out of the air. Right. The more times I say this, the more I'm like, God, I can't believe this is my joke. My yeah. humor exceeds this People kind really of like crudity. your humor. The no, this is your stage. humor. You, you have to understand that. This is your humor. This is it's, how we it's, should it's summarize. It's by being that we know, yeah. not knowing that we are. And, and this will, maybe this will solidify the concept of the dialect for everyone. And that you can sit with the discomfort of this while also supporting it. Because you know that it will enact our more just and equitable society in a way that is scientifically consistent with the historical conditions of our time um, and accounting for those things dialectically. 
the first stage of communism is when I'm having sex with your mom. And the second, when I am having sex with your dad. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching or listening. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Thanks so much, guys. We will see you later.